Olá Lisboa, boa tarde. Bem-vindos. Welcome Web Summit. Welcome to Lisbon and welcome to this panel about what does Generation Z really want. Presentations are already made, but just to check with you again, we have Jacob, we have Jay, and we have Sage on stage with us. We are very lucky because we have two 30 under 30 entrepreneurs by Forbes and also one next generation leader by Time magazine. These are our, these are our uh, invited speakers. Let's kick this off with just a little bit um, audience interaction. I think we need to know our audience. Raise your hand if you were born after 1995 and identify as a Generation Z member. Okay, thank you, Sam. And if you were born between 1980 and 1995 19, and you identify as a millennial, raise your hand, please. Old people. Okay, and if you're really, really old, old. as I am, and test, you were born test. before 1980 and think you are a member of Generation X. Okay, some dads and moms also in the audience. So, Jacob, I'm not going to ask you uh, if um, Generation Z is really a thing, but you've been, you've been working on producing and distributing content, and I'd like to ask you if it's really, really fundamentally different to work for um, audiences that identify as Generation Z as opposed to, for example, millennials. Yeah, um, I don't think so these days. I mean, I think just because, like, uh, you know, the internet is so prominent. And even like the, the story I tell people all the time is like my younger sister sends me TikToks. My mom sends me uh, Instagram reels and my dad's sending me YouTube shorts. Um, and I think like definitely short form has just uh, totally like taken over a lot of people's attention. But just I think the internet in general has become like a great way to reach uh, a lot of people, in, including Gen Z. But um, yeah, I wouldn't say that, uh, that it's, it's limited to Gen Z through content. But do you feel that, or do you, do you have data that tells you that the reception on the other side? So if the millennials and generations, you have different reactions to the same type of content? I don't have data surrounding that. I mean, I think a lot of it is just kind of like the, you know, sort of like cultural circles that I'm around and, and what I see. But yeah, again, just a lot of the conversations I have, I just feel like more and more people are, you know, listening to YouTubers, uh, listen, getting their information from podcasts. Um, but yeah, just, just more, a lot of conversational data, I guess. Okay, thank you. Jay, um, many companies and brands come to you uh, and to your company asking for help to um, how, do can, how they can interact with uh, Generation Z, uh, with their products, how can they develop strategies to communicate and uh, engage with them or create new services and products. Fundamentally, what are the misconceptions that they bring to you, if, they, if any? Yeah, good question, bro. Firstly, thanks everybody for joining us. Appreciate it. There's a whole bunch of you, which is wonderful. Um, so yeah, Jay, co-founder of Imagine Insights. Um, I think the interesting thing is for a lot of our clients, they come to us on early doors. Their assumption is that Gen Z are a lot younger than they actually are. So for a lot of the time, the first thing is to realize they're already buying their products. So um, we have 36,000 Gen Z in 111 countries around the world. Um, and we're gaining insight from them every single day. And one thing that you see is that 64% of our community are already buying luxury products. So not just products in general, but luxury products. I'm talking Chanel, Gucci, so on and so on. And one of our community actually um, commented on our platform recently that she's trying to get on the list to buy a Birkin. And it was like, they're already buying these products, but so many of our clients come in going, oh, so how can we engage with these young folk? They're going to be coming in like 10 years. And I'm like, yo, some of them are like 26, 27, 28 years old, so they're already buying your stuff. And the second thing I would say is that with Gen Z, there's this common misconception that they care about all the causes. So anything from like Black Lives Matter sustainability, which Sage will speak on in a little bit. But you find a lot of the time that there's two or three things that they really, really care about. That's like the, to the core of who they are. They will comment on many things because of socials, but then there's two or three things that they really, really generally care about. For a lot of brands, they're trying to comment on everything. So instead of just going, actually, here are the things that we actually give a damn about, they're trying to comment on so many different things, and you kind of just lose the, who that brand actually is and what they actually care about. Okay. So you have been doing such an important work in one of these causes, which is sustainability and um, a climate agenda. Do you feel that Generation Z is already uh, working these issues as the, with the same strength that other generations should already be working on? Do I think that this generation, sorry. Again. If Generation Z is already on the same boat as you are, you are on the forefront of this uh, climate agenda, is everybody uh, aware of the crisis that we are having, we're living, and if they are working and uh, demonstrating strength to work for? I mean, I, I say it and I'm going to say it again, like, 
everybody, including Gen Z, is just wildly undereducated on climate and sustainability. Um, and that's not our fault. That's like information that's being kept from us. And so that's what my work is in, is trying to give people the tools and knowledge that they need in order to make informed decisions regarding their career, their lifestyle, and how we can actually go about building a better world. You know, getting everyone on board the same vision. I would say, the, I would say yes, the majority of Gen Z like, wants to be sustainability minded. I would say millennials as well. And I think the data shows that. I think it was like two thirds of Gen Z is looking for sustainable products. The problem is people still don't have a framework for navigating what is and is not actually beneficial. And you're gonna, like a lot of people just end up kind of like feeling good about that transaction, about that purchase, without knowing what, uh, the impact behind it. We are seeing in a lot of countries uh, climate um, uh, protests or so occupations in schools, a lot of kids going to the streets and having these uh, protests. Um, do you think this will get worse in the sense of we are getting more and more of that before it, get, it gets better and we get all these frameworks that can help us navigate through this climate crisis? Yeah, I think we're going to... I think we're, we're, I mean, we're reaching a crisis point on a variety, not just sustainability, but a lot of human rights crises as well. And I'm really, I feel very emboldened by the amount of people who are coming out with a big heart. For example, so many people are boycotting Starbucks and McDonald's right now because they've invested, they've sent money to Israel. And a lot of people who, um, you know, that, that appeals to their heart, like Starbucks sales are going way down. And I think... Corporations are starting to wake up to the power that consumers have and employees have. We're seeing a rise in unionization. We're seeing a rise in boycotts. We're seeing a rise in divestment. And I think that's emboldening for me. Um, in terms of protests and whatnot, I think that's also beneficial to see more people out and about being disruptive. We literally are not taking the steps we need to avoid ecological breakdown, which will lead us to a lot of human suffering. So. If it means that we throw paint on some politicians or some corporate executives, like that's such a minor inconvenience for them, and maybe it will shock them into doing something. But also, the you know, we I don't just do protests. That's actually a pretty. That's actually not my job, right? I don't organize climate protests. There's so many avenues we need to be pursuing. Sure. So we've been talking about Generation Z and all these uh, different cohorts. In a, uh, in a perspective of consumers. Let's talk about mm. as them as workers too. Uh, and Jay, I would like to get back to you because your company, you produce a survey, a brutal honest survey about what Generation Z uh, thinks, and for example, uh, about working. Two or three takeaways from, from that study, from that service that you do every year um, in this perspective, Gen Z as workers, are they fundamentally different from the others? I think, um, just mentioned it earlier, the idea behind... So the problem with markets is we love to put people into generational because it's just easier for us to sell them, if we're being honest. easier for us to, to sell this to, to, to other people. But I think that one of the things that we're seeing Gen Z leading the charge on is the idea of them holding their employers or holding brands to account. Mm -hmm. So they're not just saying, hey, I'm going to work for you and you can actually just destroy the environment like Sage was talking about earlier. But it's the idea going... If I'm going to work for you, I need you to tell, show me what you're actually doing against these, these goals that you have. What are the actual things? What's the outworking of this? Are you just having these lofty goals so the shareholders and the stakeholders are happy? Or are you actually outworking that? Um, the second thing is actually around the idea that when they're looking at their day-to-day -day working in these companies, they want to see how what they're doing on this the granular micro level is having on the larger, bigger macro level. So they want to say, okay, if I'm doing these day-to-day -day tasks, how does that affect the bigger vision of the company? Because for them, it's the idea of going, if I'm going to pour my heart and soul into this, I want to see what the actual outcome will be. And one of the things that we're seeing from the data from a lot of our community globally is the idea, finally, that they, they actually want to stay in jobs a lot more long-term than millennials did. So millennials, for us, it was kind of sexy to start a company. Like, oh, I'm going to start a company. It's going to be amazing. Um, and then we go broke. And I'm like, oh, shit, it's real life. Um, and with a lot of Gen Z, they've watched that happen. And they've gone, actually, okay, you know what? I want a little bit of sustainability. So you would see a lot of them will have a full-time solid job. But then on the side, they'll have a side hustle that they, they can then grow until it takes over from the full-time job. So seeing that from a lot of the data from around the world. But impact is uh, surely one of the things that people tend to take in, in consideration uh, when choosing uh, between offers. The, the thing that you were saying, that you want to see what 
the output of your, the result of your work, right? Yeah, for sure. I think it's the, the companies that can say, actually, you know what, um, here is what you do on the day-to-day. -day. So say, for example, my company, we have OKRs. So it's very easy for them to say, okay, if I do X, this is how it builds into the, the vision that I've set for 2025. And for a lot of Gen Z, they want to see that. They want to say, okay, so if I do X, how is that actually going to build into the total overarching vision? Um, and, as, and as leaders and as managers, as human beings, it's very easy for us to do that because it can easy to break that down into, into something that's digestible for them. Yeah, thank you. Jacob, so you as a CEO, um, do you have any concerns when you're hiring people about uh, generation, about which cohort they belong to, uh, if they are more aware of the meaning of impact of work? Is that something that you have to deal on a day-to-day -day basis when you're choosing to hire people? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone is going to have, you know, different preferences from like a management perspective, like, um, you know, and I think like for me as a manager, like that's the number one thing that I try to figure out with people that work for me is like, you know, what motivates them, um, you know, what gets them excited to, to do this work. Um, but yeah, kind of uh, to what Jay was saying, though, I, th I think I was understanding what you were saying about how um, like more of, of Gen Z is like wanting to be like dialed into like the longer term of a company. Yeah, and I think someone was asking me that the other day, like, oh, you know, you're Gen Z. Uh, what do you think? Is it a popular thing that like uh, you want equity in the companies you work for? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I started, you know, doing this a long time ago, but like, Yeah, and I, you know, thankfully, uh, some of the companies I've worked for in the past, I've been able to get a piece of because I just knew that was something to ask for. But yeah, I, I absolutely think that like younger generations are starting to be like, well, if I'm going to put five years into this company, you know, I want to get a payoff that's more than just a salary, um, you know, and just be like a worker, uh, a cog in the machine, right? Um, but I also think that like a big thing that I think about, and admittedly, you know, what what's kind of pushed me to start my own company is like. Um, you know, just the desire to be, uh, you know, cr uh, free um, and and be able to express myself. And that's why, like, you know, I try to do that as much as I can, right? Because, um, you know, I don't think that, like, a good motive for a company... I mean, I, everyone has is entitled to their own opinions, of course, but uh, I hear some people that are like, oh, I started my own company so that I can be my own boss. Um, and it's like, well, what about all the other people that work for you, you know? Like, they're going to have bosses. Like, the, think about them, so... I try to set things up as much as I can to like uh, give people that space to you know be creative and explore side hustles as well because um, I think more of Gen Z is starting to just ask for more of that and, and have more freedom with their jobs. Okay, Sage, um, I've been covering uh, startups uh, for the last eight years, mostly in Europe. I don't know uh, in the United States what the scenario is, but I'd like to ask you. What I've seen is a lot of new companies. They they grow. They grow from zero. But with a, um, an office politics that seems like the ones that I met when I went into my job. So there is a learning curve. They have to abandon some old notions and old concepts and adopt new ones because that's what they learned. That that's, what, that's what we've been transmitting all along. You've been building a nonprofit. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it different? Do you also have a learning curve? Do you also detect these problems that people bring in? ideas that are not aligned with sustainability and all these agenda that this agenda that you're working on and how do you deal with it i don't know anything about building a for-profit so i can't say if it's different i literally don't know the first thing um it's definitely different i mean the nonprofit space sucks because you're just you're going to foundations and you don't have a self-sustaining income you're constantly asking However, there are a lot of benefits to being a nonprofit, and I'm not trying to sell like a service or something like that. We're trying to push education, and so it's just not something that we want to run as a for-profit. Um, so Sustainable and Just Future is an organization I founded um, based off of a program I started at Berkeley, and we're basically working to get the next generation the education they need to be able to adapt to a climate change future. And we're scaling into universities. We are working on some digital media, like materials that would be useful for educators and et cetera. There's a bunch of things. Um, in terms of growing and scaling, like, yeah, there, it is difficult because everybody who comes to me with a lot of enthusiasm about being a part of the team also doesn't have a good climate education because almost nobody does. So I, it's interesting to bring them into the vision and have to, um, educate and learn together while we're trying to build an organization and while I'm trying to balance like things like this when I get the opportunity to speak in front of 
um, 15,000 people like I did this morning, like that's something that we have to carve out time for because there's an impact that can be made. If my goal is education, there's my chance to educate business leaders. But um, my director of curriculum, Ellie, is over here with me and she's teaching the program at Berkeley next year. Or, next, or she's been teaching, but next semester she's going to have 400 students, so she's breaking my record. Okay, we have our last five minutes. Let's not ignore the question that is of the theme, the subject of this panel, which is uh, what does Generation Z really want? I want to hear you three about this question. Uh, Sage, we could uh, start with you. I think for Gen Z, values are becoming a more and more important. I mean, we are looking for... A, better employment in terms of like living wages and benefits and whatnot. I think a lot more of us identify as socialists. A lot more of us want walkable communities. A lot more of us are interested. Eh, I was going to say interested in divesting from consumerism, but this is, this is the Sheehan generation. Let me not give us too much credit. Um, but I, it is encouraging to see more people voting with their dollar um, and more people choosing to opt out of extractive and exploitative systems. Um, I think we're more interested in a second-hand economy. Thrifting is so popular with us. And, I mean, I think we're trying to lead with our hearts. It's messy and it's difficult. Like, I think all of us collectively... Well, okay, I, I knew about it. But a lot of people collectively just learned about the cobalt crisis in Congo, that there's a genocide happening and that it's happening so that we can have metals for our technology, for our phones and laptops. And we're like, I live in a society where I cannot opt out of that. And I'm excited to see us take that rage and that empathy and move into these systems and demand that they change. Because we don't have to accept that as a reality. It doesn't have to be a necessary evil in order for us to have the privileges that we do in the West. Thank you. Jay, what can you add to this? It's going to be hard to follow that up. Um, I would say, from a brand perspective, um, I feel like Sage is better... Sage and Justin probably better to speak from a Gen Z as in like from their own personal experience as Gen Z. But I would say from a brand perspective, one of the things that we're seeing from our community, what they're expecting from brands is I would say um, conversational transparency. And I mentioned this in a talk that I did this morning, the idea we're going historically with brands, we kind of like, with the way we use social media is almost like I'm having a house party at my apartment in London. It's a vibe because I live in London, whatever. But you're coming to my house. I invite you all over. I lock the front door, which is kind of weird. And then I take out a microphone and I scream in your face. And that's kind of how we view social media. It's like, this is what we're doing. This is how amazing we are. And for a lot of Gen Z, engaging with a brand like that seems weird. And the reason for that is because social media has leveled the playing field. So Gen Z have grown up with being able to, I can DM X celebrity on social media and they could reply. It's possible. So their engagement with brands and um, quote unquote the hierarchy is completely different. So what they expect from brands is that complete transparency. So as a brand, that conversational transparency, sorry, where we're saying actually we're going to engage with you in a conversation, whether that's via research, whatever it may be, to understand actually what you want from us as a brand. And then we're going to be transparent around that. Because so many times brands will say wanky things where we're like, we're going to do X, Y, Z by this date, kind of hoping that we all forget that they said they were going to do it by that date. And with Gen Z, they're going to hold you to account and they're going to Google and they're going to find out if you actually did that. So what they want to see is, is that conversa conversational transparency, getting lost in my words there, that conversational transparency where you can say, this is what we say we're going to do. We're going to have a conversation with you around it and then we're going to make sure that we're going to do it. Okay, thank you. Jacob, the same thing. Yeah, um, I think uh, definitely like a trend that I'm seeing that I think Gen Z starting to uh, sort of think about in work is just, again, like I think just more uh, freedom in general. And I think that's what's cool about like, you know, the gig economy or, you know, side hustles and, um, you know, the kind of like uh, level of, of uh, or lack of friction in creating your own business these days is I think it's giving more people the opportunity to really like just do whatever they're passionate about and like make money from it as a side hustle and, and maybe even more. But, um, you know, like I saw this article the other day that was saying how more and more of Gen Z is like leaning into freelancing because they don't want to get fired at their jobs. Right. Um, and just with like a lot of the layoffs happening, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like in the power of your employer, whether or not you can continue making money. Um, so I think it'll be interesting, like as the world gets more distributed, if that's a trend that continues where like, um, you know, maybe I don't even know if this is possible, but like maybe, you know, full time jobs are a thing of the past and freelance is really the way to go, because at least you can have multiple streams of income and there's not one person have, that has control of you. 
And uh, yeah, that's one thing that like you know Gen, Gen Z hates. It's like we we don't like control. Like we want to be in control of, of our own lives. Okay, so nobody said bigger salaries, but uh, everybody needs to pay their bills. That was our time. Thank you for being a great audience. A warm applause to our speakers, please. And stick around. Web Summit has more for you this 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 evening and tomorrow. Bye.